thanks, uh, Mary, for inviting me here today. I actually feel fairly, well, really honored, actually, that I was um, asked to, to stand up here and talk about organic dairy. I, um, you know, I just, I came up with this title sitting in the airport, and, um, and hopefully you'll figure out why as I go through my talk, but I really feel like sort of our movements and our future movements in organic dairy are going to have a huge impact on our next generation of farmers and all organic farming for that matter. All right, just you know, some statistics here. Organic dairy is a really fast-growing sector of organic, 10% growth about or more each year. Um, right now, we have about 2,000 organic dairy farms in the United States, which, which is great. Um, and we've got a couple hundred thousand certified organic dairy cows out there grazing. These numbers are a little bit old, but there hasn't been a huge increase in the number of organic dairies because some of the, some of the economic uh, downfalls over the last few years, so they're probably fairly representative. Let's see here. I'm not sure where I put There we go. All right, I was able to, to basically take this from a very nice USDA publication by McBride and Green, and I actually got to meet Catherine, which was great. We use this publication a lot. It's very useful. It's been very useful to us, actually, to secure grants to have this data available, so it is really important. Um, again, it's a, it was published in 2009, but the data is from 2005, and I just wanted to show you where the core of the organic dairies are, of course, the Northeast. Um, uh, the upper Midwest, and then there's quite a number also in the West. Uh, there's more growth in organic dairy now down in the South as well, and I'm sure, and, and Utah, um, I know that. And um, I'm sure our next map that's made will, be, will have quite a bit uh, more states colored on there. Okay, okay. so um, next generation. We see a lot of these maps, a lot of these graphs. How many meetings have you gone to where you see a decline in some kind of farming uh, sector? In Vermont, I don't know how many times I've seen this graph go up on a screen. The decline in Vermont dairy farms, 1947, about 12,000 farms. Um, 2004, you can see, well, right now, currently, 2011, we have about 1,046 very common graph that we all see too often. What has this done to places like Vermont? And I'm speaking here from personal experience. I don't know how many people would dare to put a small, you know, child photo of yourself up on the screen, but there I am. Look at that smile. And that's my sister Tracy out on the farm. Um, I grew up in a really small town in Vermont. We had uh, 150 dairy farms. We have a population of about 1,600. Today we have three. Um, and so, you know, this decline in small farms in rural areas has had a huge impact on the economics in those places. And I think we've all seen this a lot too. I can use a pointer here. I don't have to point it out, but but this is this was what my farm looked like after. My father sold his cows in 1996. Okay, we see this a lot traveling across the United States. Barns falling in, not taken care of anymore. Um, economic prosperity on farms and in the rural communities just declines as the number of farms, especially small farms, decline in places like Vermont. Don't start crying yet. The story is going to get better. <laughs> Think. There we go. All right. So. <clears throat> the next generation again. You see this drastic decline in conventional farms, but one thing that has been so great and the optimism like Ellen was talking about in the Northeast is the fact that we're actually seeing an increase in organic dairy farms. And one of the questions Mary asked us to answer is, how has the organic research helped conventional farms? Well, conventional farms are now organic farms and those conventional farms wouldn't be there any longer, at least uh, like in places like Vermont, if it wasn't for organic farming. And I realize that's not the case everywhere, but there are a lot of places out there like Alberg, Vermont, where this type of farming is really taking hold and making a new type and a new future for farming in rural places. 
Okay, so one of the first uh, OREI grants that was funded actually was to Bob Parsons at the University of Vermont. It was really to look at, because everybody was skeptical, you know, are these organic dairy farmers making any money? And uh, the answer was mm, not at first. Uh, the pay price wasn't really quite high enough, but over time as the pay price increased, you can see that the return on the farmer's ass uh, assets increased as well. Um, and this is after, Bob tells me, uh, the cost of living was taken out as well. So it's actually a pretty good return. So you can see that this is actually making a huge difference in these farmers' lives in a rural community. But the one thing I want to point out here, with my pointer, is that purchase feed makes up a huge percentage of the cost on farms in the Northeast, as well as farms in other places as well. And purchase feed, for those of you who are in the world that I'm in, are grain concentrates primarily. Okay, next. All right, so like I said, this is uh, organic dairy farming, especially in small communities, is presenting an opportunity for, for farms to remain in business, to pass on to the next generation, and even for new dairy farmers to actually start up. This is unheard of, honestly, in the conventional world. It really is. Um, it's a major contributor to the rural economy especially in places like Vermont and Maine as well. Um, and what Bob Parsons told me in his study, and basically they are monitoring and continue to monitor about 40 or so farms every year, that 75% of all those farms would no longer be in business if they did not switch over to organic dairy farming. So that's a huge impact. I know we can't all take all the credit for that or anything, but it is a huge impact in rural America. And I just want to point out a few people here uh, John Clark, Jr., Hardwick, Vermont, over here, uh, giving a field day, second generation. His family was going to go out of business. They transitioned to organic. Um, they sell to Horizon, and now John and his wife and their two, two children are running the farm. Guy Schwarnier, Organic Valley producer, uh, same thing. His father, who now I think is 82 years old, still on the farm with him. He was able to buy the farm from his father. He never thought he had a future there. Um, and now his son, who's in the eighth grade, Matt, is so excited to become a dairy farmer. All right? I may not get through everything, but I think this is a nice way to end what we've all been talking about, to see what all our efforts are really doing. Um, John Rudder and Beverly Rubber, Rudder. I choked a little bit because he just passed away. And he was just just a huge influence in the organic dairy industry in Vermont and actually across the nation. But you know, the really great thing is that now Beverly is working with two young um, aspiring dairy farm, farmers to take over their farm. So I just thought that um, you should all know that everything we're, we're working for here is making a huge difference, especially in the next generation, including myself. Um, that nasty little picture you saw before, uh, <clears throat> it brings hope, you know, um, brings money, <laughs> more money than we ever had on our farm. And we're not dairy farming, but we actually make part of our living on our farm. We are certified organic, my husband and I. We were able to buy the farm from my parents, but we also make a living because we have so many organic dairy farms in Vermont now, and they need a place to graze their animals. And so we're able to sort of capitalize on that on our farm. So again, all of our work and efforts are really keeping farms in business here. And this, again, was some data that was collected by Catherine, who's sitting down here now, just basically showing that organic dairy farmers are very optimistic about their future. And again, this is, I think, from data from 2005, but that remains so. I've never seen some of my farmers that have transitioned to, and I call them mine, I don't know why, but um, <laughs> so optimistic about their future and their children's future. And the fact that their kids want to actually come home to the farm now, and this is something that would not have happened otherwise. All right. So I tried to go, I got so overwhelmed putting this presentation together because there's so many great things happening. I didn't even know where to start, you know. There's so many wonderful organizations out there, and you can't even name them all off, but a lot of them, such as NOFA Vermont, Moses, oh, 10 minutes, um, really just starting this movement, really providing farmers 
um, with the, the outreach and education that they needed early on. And just like Ellen experienced, I remember seven years ago when I first moved to Vermont, honestly, I can't, I can't imagine not asking a farmer what they wanted, but I guess that's just the way I grew up. Um, but, you know, when a university person went out on an organic dairy, farmer, a dairy farm, they were really shunned away. You know, we had nothing to offer. And so I really had to latch on like a little leech um, to uh, <laughs> Nat Bacon, who worked for Nova Vermont, and like, will you take me out with you? And don't tell anybody who I work for, you know, um, to really get it in. And now I'm proud to say that I don't have to latch on to Nova Vermont anymore and that I can have my own workshop. So we are really starting to make a difference at the universities. There are a lot of committed extensions folks out there that are working with organic dairy and we're making headway in building their trust um, in wanting to work with us. And I think building research is our, our next step. Why do we need research? And um, Andre Brito's here. I didn't put his whole grant, but he just received a grant last year really to look at you know, what are the needs of the Northeast dairy in industry and some of their limitations. And I couldn't even put everything up here, you know. I <laughs> I remember that when I first started my job, I asked, the, well, what do you want? I asked the dairy, what do you want me to do? He didn't know what to say, but a week later, he knew exactly what to say, and he called me up, and he had this, like, you know, list that kind of rolled out on the floor. So the minute farmers know that you're listening and that you really want to work with them and help them, and you realize that, they're, that you're sincere, that you care about them, and that you're also with them, you're not above them, um, and that you're working with them to solve their problems, they'll tell you exactly what they want. <laughs> no problem. And, and so I thank Andre for sharing this information with me, and I believe he has a poster downstairs too. Um, feed costs are high. You know, ways to combat high feed costs, and again, remember the 33% um, cost for concentrates. This exists on a lot of farms. Understanding and meeting new rules like the pasture rule, lack of information on herd health strategies, breeding for organic systems like livestock breeding, not just crops, varieties for organic systems, variety trials are so important, industry supports them conventionally, but we don't have it going yet organically and we need that. Untrained professionals, meaning people like me, but also vets, okay, um, and nutritionists that don't know how to work with organic producers. It's actually really limiting production in a lot of ways. Um, unreliable information from non-credible sources, which is where we come in, um, hopefully providing better research, and lack of resource material um, and lack of, of research in general. And these are just a few of the things in Andre's survey. They want to know their environmental impact. They want to know about fly control, managing nutrients. Um, they want more intense training. They want to learn more. Isn't that great? Who would have thought? Uh, health benefits of their products. And then really they need help with business management overall. So there's lots of work to do here. And I actually wake up in the morning sometimes. And for those that know me, know that I'm on all these different projects because there's so much to do. And I have a hard time, you know, just really saying no because I know how much needs to be done. We have a long ways to go, but we have a really good start. Um, so there's been a lot of projects funded, and I, I probably stretched way too wide here, but I, I looked in the Chris database and I kind of found about 30 uh, organic dairy related grants. And so, you know, why should we do this? 30 grants? How many grants have been funded by the USDA? Anybody know that number? 30 is not very much, and most of those are hatch funding, to be honest because the USDA organic program hasn't been around that long. Um, and the hatch funding, we all know how much money you get there. So there hasn't been a whole lot of, a whole lot of funds yet. So we got a lot of work to do, but through OREI, we've been funding a lot more grants and quite a few in the last few years. SAIR has been a really strong supporter for organic dairy, but again, we all know how much SAIR grants are too. Um, there's new graduate student grants that just came out through SARE, and I know one of Andre's students received one of those grants, and another graduate student in Kentucky, a SARE Agro Ecosystem grant was um, awarded to, to UNH as well. And then I found about 50 other projects funded through SARE grants, and about 50% of those went to the Northeast, which means we're hogging all the money. Um, but, um, and a lot of those were for grazing in particular. So we're really, we've got a lot more work to do, and we need more money, I guess. So hopefully we'll keep, you know, keep that going. Um, and then there's other um, 
agencies, mostly pri private agencies um, or nonprofits that have funded work like OFRF and Organic Valley and Stonyfield, and they continue to fund work in organic dairy as well. But still, these larger USDA grants are really, you know, the, the larger pots of money we need to move more, more forward with research. Um, just to get back, I'm not even going to make through this, but um, high grain prices, this is a huge barrier for a lot of dairy farms, especially those in the northeast um, and the west as well. The Midwest is a little bit better off. So what we've spent a lot of research, or what we've conducted a lot of research on, and Chris is here, but I give all the credit to Rick, because Chris walked out on us. I mean, he moved off to North Carolina. He left us holding the bag with a strand. But we've done... <laughs> How you feel about yourself now? Okay, so so anyway, we forgave him, but still got to pull that out once in a while. So we've we've done a lot of research trying to reduce off-farm grain inputs, and really one of the primary ways to do this in the Northeast is to grow better forages, and to really help farmers maximize the feed they can grow on their own farms. Seems like a no-brainer, but we still have a long ways to go actually um, to get people really doing. Um, Ex extending their grazing season, for example, some work that uh, done through my program that was funded through SARE and also through Organic Valley, looking at planting small grains in the fall and grazing them early in the spring. And what we found through this work is that we can actually start grazing about two weeks earlier, okay, and you get the cows out earlier, obviously you're not going to have to feed as much grain. So we found through our work... Um, also with brassicas, that we could actually extend the grazing season in the Northeast by more than a month. And that would really help um, save on the grain bills. There's been a lot of work also done by Cindy Daly, who's at Chico State. She's really leading the way on the West Coast. And she's also looked at economics under different grain feeding systems, looking at high and low uh, grain ra rations on farms. And basically, she's found that, oh. I lost, yeah, I know, stealth grace. I lost part of her slide, but you know, farmers can reduce grain costs, reduce milk production a little bit, and make more money. Okay, so it's again helping them. Oh, there it is. There we go. Figure out how to go about that. And um, I have to embarrass maybe Andre a little bit. I don't even know if he's back there. I got my glasses on, but um, and and Andre, he just joined us on the northeast, and he's just like going like gangbusters, writing all these grants, and it's so great to have, that, have him here because he's an animal nutritionist. And really, he's kind of that first organic animal nutritionist we've had to really work with, and he's just going like gangbusters. Um, and he's writing grants with all of us. He's a great collaborator. He's got several posters downstairs, I believe, looking at alternatives, um, trying to find cheaper sources of energy to feed cows instead of cornmeal, maybe looking at molasses. He's doing a lot of research in that area. Um, other folks that have been recently funded through the USDA are Jennifer McAdams. She's here. I believe she has a poster, again, looking at ways to improve um, the pastures through different forages. So you can see there's a lot of emphasis on this. A recent uh, proposal at the University of Wisconsin, I believe, um, there's also a poster here on this topic looking at strategies of pasture supplementation, again, trying to reduce those grain costs. And then finally, I'll talk about myself. Um, and, and Cindy Daly and I just received a grant to actually try to bring all this information together. Please raise your hand if we have not bugged you about eOrganic. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out who I should hit up. That's why I ask people to raise their hands. John McQueen's here recording all this, and Bernadine made a reference to this. Um, one of the things that we found, and we've heard over and over and over again, is that our professionals need more training. We hold training for our vets um, and other folks, and they have a hard time coming to a week-long conference or a meeting. And so what we've decided to do is to try to put together um, online and internet resources to essentially train them so they don't even have to leave their business and go without, you know, conducting their veterinary service for weeks at a, or a week at a time. We hear that a lot. So Cindy, myself, Deb Haliba, um, Harriet Behar at Moses, Lisa McCrory at Nodpa and Ed Mulpey are all working on this project. So you'll be seeing a couple of um, courses actually coming out and our hope is also that folks that have organic dairy programs at universities will use those as well for their undergraduates. So I need to kind of go through this quickly, but this is the power of e-organic. 
Does that resonate in all of you? When the pasture rule first came out, we felt a little rushed. How are we going to get this information out to farmers, to certifiers, et cetera? And we were able to put together a series of webinars very quickly with people like Sarah Flack um, to basically get this information out. I'm hitting the wrong button. To help farmers, certifiers, and others um, comply with the pasture rule. And we turned this around, I think, in like a week or so. Um, bulletins, newsletters, three webinars, and videos to help people be able to comply with the new pasture rule. All those materials are archived. We didn't have a workshop that 10 people came to and the 50 people couldn't make it because it snowed heavy that day or, you know, the tractor broke down or they couldn't get the manure spread or whatever the reason was, they can go back online and get that material. All right. And the beautiful thing about this, just like today, is that we're sitting here at this conference. We've all paid some money to come here and plane tickets and whatever. Some people can't afford to do that. Some people don't have time to come. They can sit in their office right now and watch me blah, 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 blah for 32 minutes, right? I'm over now, um, you know, to talk about all this. So anyway, um, I will finish up, I promise. Challenges and directions for future research. We have, I think, maybe more now, but four certified organic research dairy farms in the United States. Right? We have Al Alfred State. No, no, not anymore. All right, I should delete them. <laughs> Chico State, um, University of Minnesota, Jim Riddle's here, and then, of course, UNH. We need to keep these things going. This is our chance to con conduct the systems research that we all talk about because we actually have these dairy systems on campuses. She's going to kick me off. Okay. Um, long-term research trials, and then and finally now with these dairies, I feel like we really have a commitment to educate the future farmers at our universities um, because these all have undergraduate programs as well, and I think that's great. So I really want to thank um, Rick Kurzbergen, Deb Haliba, Cindy Daly, Bob Parsons, Andre Brito, and Ed Maltby for sending me some information, and thanks for letting me go on for four more extra minutes. <laughs>